But once you accept that emotions are tools and you educate yourself as to what the emotions are and what they're telling you, you now then can practice the third step, which is to take a deep breath when you have an emotion and take a step back from the situation. Then the next step is to assess what's going on. Remember the basic relationship rule. The person is doing the best they can given their model of the world, how they see what's going on, and their skill sets. Today's masterclass is on mastering your emotions, and our guest today is Ed Darby, PhD. And because it's a masterclass, he's going to introduce himself and tell us where he got to and how he got there. Over to you. Thanks for having me, Anita. Let me give you the, the backstory, and I'll tell you how I got to where I am. In my family of, of origin, emotions were not dealt with very well at all. And so I grew up not dealing with emotions and going into my head and thinking more than feeling. And I did that for my, my own well-being. Now, my dad was never abusive, nor was my mom. Their mm -hmm. generation just didn't deal well with feelings. So that was how I, I, I managed. So then I get into graduate school. And they didn't teach me much about emotions then either because it wasn't a well-researched subject. Uh -huh. So while I was doing my internship in San Francisco, I asked my a neighbor of where my dad lived at the time if I could sit in on their clinical groups. This is an alcoholic treatment program, the Henry Olaf House. Okay. And the guy said no. I said, well, why not? He said, well, I'll tell you what you can do. What you can do is you can be a participant observer in our alcoholic treatment groups. Now, I had never problem with alcohol or drugs, didn't use them. And so I said, fine. Now, my thinking, Anita, was here I am. I'm just about ready to finish my PhD and, and my clinical internship. I can handle this really easily. Yes. I was so wrong. It took <laughs> these folks six months, and they called me a non-drinking alcoholic. Oh, wow. Yeah, and the reason for that was because they avoided their feelings by going into dr uh, drugs or alcohol. Hmm. I avoided my feelings by going into my head and my books. So I got through that, learned a lot about me, and then I started my first job, my only job, by the way. And I was working with the California Youth Authority with incarcerated young women. Mm -hmm. And these young women didn't do well with their emotions either. For them, they either hurt themselves or they hurt others. So I had to figure out a way to help them understand what emotions were because my language was up here out of graduate school and their language was down here with barely a high school education. Mm -hmm. I also had to deal with, with jaded correctional staff who didn't want to deal with emotions because they saw emotions as messy, which they sometimes are. Yes. And they didn't know how to deal with the emotions of their female clients. So I developed the emotions as tools model in order to explain what emotions were and how to deal with them. And we'll get into that. Yes. When I retired some 15 years ago now, I looked around and I decided the general population needed some information about emotions. So I wrote my two Amazon best-selling books. The first one was on emotions as tools, and that was the model. Mm -hmm. And the second one was master your anger as a strategic tool. So that's how I got to be where I am now. And I needed a way to label myself, and I called myself the emotions doctor, which, by the way, I have to laugh every time I think about it given where I came from. So that's how I got yeah. to where I am. That's quite incredible. And I'm looking forward to this masterclass. So welcome, Ed. And Thank you for having me. You're most welcome. So let's talk about emotions. What do emotions as tools mean? Okay, good question. When I talk about mastering emotions as tools, and I'll explain each of my terms, the idea of mastering an emotion is that you learn how to get the most out of it, as opposed to what most people want to do, mm. which is to control their emotions. And control means that I use brute force to prevent that emotion from manifesting itself. Uh -huh. Now, when I talk about strategic using t uh, emotions as strategic tools, my thought here, Anita, is the same way that 
if you look at the military doing a strategic, taking away a strategic target, they pick the target and they figure out what they need to do to eliminate it. It's specifically focused on that target. When we use emotion strategically, we need to learn how to apply that emotion and the information it gives us, and I'll explain all this, to the situation in which we find ourselves. Now, finally, the idea of an emotion as a tool is this. We all use tools. We have our cell mm -hmm. phones. We have remote controls on TV. We may have a bandsaw in the, in the garage, or we may have a washing machine. They're all tools. We yes. learn how to use them. If I want to figure out how to use my remote control, I call my kids over and say, how do I get it to do what I want it to do? <laughs> it's a tool. You learn yeah. how to use it. So that's the idea behind mastering your emotions as strategic tools. Mm -hmm. Now, let me explain what emotions are and what they do and why we have them. We are all born with emotions. There are five primary mm -hmm. emotions. It's mad, sad, glad, fear, disgust, and surprise. I think that may be six. In any event, we're born with them. Um, mm -hmm. I, my my youngest grandson is just turned one, and you can see the emotions develop in him. Now, emotions evolved when we lived in caves to help us master and survive in our very dangerous environment. Yes, we didn't have sharp teeth, we didn't have sharp claws, but what we had was our brain and our emotions. So mm -hmm. the emotions develop to do two things. First of all, they develop to alert us to possible dangers in our environment. And they do that very quickly and they do it subconsciously. Mm -hmm. And secondly, the emotions prepared us to take action. So if you take a look at some of the basic emotions, let's take a look at fear. Yes. The message of fear is there is a danger and that danger will kill us. Fear prepares us to escape, and that's what it's supposed to do. When you look at anger, the message of anger is there's a threat out there, and I am more powerful than that threat. So anger now alerts us to the presence of a threat and prepares us to go to war with that threat. That's anger. Mm -hmm. Okay, when you look at an emotion like anxiety, mm -hmm. which develops later than early childhood, anxiety is a future-based emotion, the message of which is there may be a threat out there and that threat may hurt us. Now, anxiety comes in two forms. One is called eustress, E-U-S-T-R-E-S-S, -E -S -S, and anxiety is eustress, prepares us to take action to do something about the possible threat. This is what my students do when they study for an exam, or if I'm going for an interview, a job mm -hmm. interview, and I'm really nervous about it. My anxiety tells me there may be a threat out there, and it could be because I might not do well, but my anxiety as you stress prepares me to, to take action, to learn what I need to do, what I need to say, how to say it. So when I go into that interview, I'm ready. Now the other side of anxiety, which is what most people experience and want to avoid, is called distress, D-I-S-S-T-R-E-S-S. -S. And anxiety is distress, immobilizes us. That's the one where they say, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. I can't take this. And what about that? And what about, and so we do nothing. Mm -hmm. So as you can see, all emotions do is they alert us to our how we see a situation and they prepare us to take action in that situation. So if you want to understand the emotional cycle, this is how it works. You unconsciously perceive the, emo the situation and the emotion. You feel that in your body. So it's important for your listeners and viewers to know their body. Where yes. in their body do they feel stress? Where in, and I'll talk about stress here in another minute. Where in their body do they feel anxiety? For me, I feel it in my stomach. Now, once you experience the emotion, then you go to the next step, which is to say, first you need to validate it. And validating says, I'm feeling this emotion. This is an important step, Anita, because most people don't want to experience their emotions because they are messy and they don't understand them. Definitely. So when you validate your emotion, 
you're saying, okay, this is what I feel. Mm -hmm. This is my feeling and I accept it. But then we go on to the next step because now we need to assess how appropriate the emotion is. And that's critical because that involves, okay, what is the message of the emotion? How well does it fit the situation? I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. A few years ago, I was going to teach my class. So I left my office where I was working and I went out to the university. In between my office and the university, my stomach started to churn. So that's anxiety. Uh -huh. So now my thought was, well, wait a minute, what's going on? What am I anxious about? Well, I'm going to my class. So I went through a mental checklist. Do I have my notes for my class? Yes. Have I checked at home? Everything's fine at home. Everything okay at the office? Yes. Once I did that, I decided that the anxiety I was feeling didn't fit the situation. So I don't know, maybe it was gas. I mean, who knows at this point? <laughs> but I decided not to give it any more control, power, or influence, mm. and it went away. So that then is assessing the nature of the threat, how appropriate it is to the situation. Now, I could have decided, wait a minute, my anxiety is telling me I did not take care of a situation at work. Perhaps I had a kid in a suicide room that I didn't alert staff to. Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, now what I would have needed to do is pull over, get on my cell phone, call my staff and say, this is what you need to do regarding X, Y, Z. That's using emotion as a strategic tool. The anxiety yeah. alerts me to a possible threat. My cerebral cortex analyzes the threat to see how appropriate it is and then makes a decision on how I want to respond rather than react to the threat that may or may not exist. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And that, <clears throat> can you just distinguish between fear and anxiety for the listeners yeah. too, please? Yes, very good question. Now the word fear mm -hmm. has come to take on meaning that's beyond the emotion itself. The title of your podcast is Courage to be Fearless. There was a book out a few years ago called Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. Yes. In that particular case, fear is synonymous with anxiety. Mm -hmm. And my approach is to say, I don't want to take away the importance of fear. Let me give you an example. Let's say you're in an office building and the elevator opens and... <clears throat> You see somebody in that elevator and you get this fear because fear says there's a threat and the threat's going to hurt me. And your brain says, well, but he looks fine. I don't see any problem. And yet your body's telling you this guy is dangerous. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't mean he is. But in this particular case, what I'm saying is validate your fear and take the next elevator. The way the word fear is used is, again, it's synonymous with anxiety. Anxiety, remember, tells us there may be a threat. So what I'm saying is, let's say if you feel fear and there's a potential danger in that situation, honor the fear mm -hmm. and take action. But understand that in most other situations, it's not fear that you're experiencing, it's anxiety. Uh -huh. Because anxiety, as I say, is a future-based emotion that alerts you to and prepares you to deal with a possible threat. So if you understand its anxiety, now you can say, what's the nature of the perceived possible threat? What Love do it. I want to do about it? Does that make mm. sense? Definitely. And the key point there is it's future based. Yes. If you can understand that too. Right. So I'm not, <clears throat> I'm not saying change our language. If you want to mm -hmm, say, mm -hmm courage to be fearless, that's fine. Just understand that it's mm -hmm. not fear that you're dealing with, it's anxiety. And, and by the way, the interesting thing about anxiety, there's another face to anxiety, and that's called anticipation. And here's how that works. If let's say I'm facing a job interview, uh -huh. and I'm anxious about it, so I do my homework, <clears throat> I find out how to deal with, with my, my boss, or how to deal with the interviewer, what do I need to talk about? What do I need to present in terms of my own qualifications? Now I've done everything I can. I'm ready. 
So in that case, I'm now anticipating the interview because my my thought is bring it on. <laughs> and that's dealing with a future event, but looking forward to it because I'm prepared to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Can you explain how your approach helps the listeners to deal with specific feelings such as anxiety, guilt, shame, or anger? Oh, yes, I can. Be glad to do that. Here's the thing. <clears throat> Let's talk mm -hmm. about stress first. Mm -hmm. We need to understand what stress is. My definition of stress is where expectations, what I think will happen or should happen, okay. <clears throat> does not match reality. Mm -hmm. So I have expectations here and yeah. I have reality here and one doesn't re match the other. If I understand that, I have two choices. If I'm stressed out over a situation, I need to take a look at what I expect should happen mm. and compare it to what actually is happening. Uh -huh. If my expectations are off, let's say, for example, um, okay, I, 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 Put together a, a gift for somebody okay and i'm excited about this gift for them and my expectation is that they, if this is not a real good example it's the best i could come up with right now <laughs> it's great it's <laughs> so, great go with it so so anyway so i give them this gift right and they get this look of disappointment on their face mm -hmm. so now i'm stressed out because i'm thinking well what's going on here my expectation that they were going to mm -hmm. really like it doesn't match the reality so now I have a choice. It was my expectation off or am I misunderstanding what the reality is? Uh -huh. Because it could be one or the other. Now, should I have expected them to really like it? Yeah, but maybe I misjudged what I, what I gave them or maybe they have one or whatever. Uh -huh. On the other hand, the reality is I'm getting this look on their face. It may have nothing to do with the gift. Interesting. Uh, let, let me, <clears throat> let me give you uh, another example. Uh -huh. Um, when I first started working, this is better. When I first started working, I wasn't, I, the training that I got to be a senior psychologist was not real good, to be quite okay. honest. Mm -hmm. So I had, a, I had two psychologists that I was responsible for. One was a really good worker. Her name, we'll call her Jane. And the other was, was a, a slaggard. We'll call him Jim. Okay. So I wanted to deal with Jim and I, I, called up to Sacramento, which is headquarters. And I said, what do I need to do? And what they told me was you need to put out this letter that says all psychologists need to follow the rules. If they uh -huh. don't, there will be disciplinary actions. It was a general letter. It was meant for Jim, not for Jane. Jane comes into my office. She'd been an employee for some 25 years and she is pissed. Oh, she looks at me and she says, she says, Ed, she says, how can you send this letter to me? How can you threaten me with, with discipline when I have never done anything? I've been a model employee. Okay. My expectation was that she would see that it wasn't her. She would see that the discipline quote was boilerplate. Uh -huh. It went out on all these kinds of letters, but that's not the way she took it. She took it mm -hmm. as a personal affront to her. So what I had to do, my expectation was fine, but I had to adjust my view of reality. Mm -hmm. And my view of reality, she's misunderstanding what I'm saying. So I needed to correct her view of what was going on. Once I did that and told her, it doesn't have anything to do with you, you're fine. Then the anger went away. Absolutely. So that's bringing reality <clears throat> into, to, into match with expectations. It's excellent. Now let's talk about guilt versus shame. The message of guilt is that there's something, I've done something wrong. Guilt prepares us to correct the mistake that I've made. So mm -hmm. if I'm feeling guilty about something, I need to figure out what do I need to do to make it right? Now, shame, the message of shame is there's something wrong with me. Shame is a real insidious emotion in the sense that parents do not want to shame their kids. Mm -hmm. We all say you've been a bad boy and that's fine if we do it a few times, but if we're constantly using it, our son or grandson begins to get the idea there's something wrong with me. It's shame is very difficult to get past because how do I change me? Yes. So definitely. if you understand that, instead of feeling you can experience guilt because I did something wrong, mm. but not shame. So the message then is I did something wrong. I need to correct it, but it's not 
necessarily means that there's something wrong with me. I screwed up and now I need to make it right. So let's talk about anger. I'm going through this pretty quickly, but your viewers can go back over the, the video and can go through it as many times Absolutely. as they need to. Yes, definitely. The message of anger is there is a threat out there and I am more powerful than the threat. So I can eliminate it by going to war with it. The challenge with anger, there's a couple of challenges with it. First of all, when it comes to men, men tend to use anger as a secondary emotion. Now, there's a misperception that anger is always a secondary emotion, and it isn't. A secondary emotion is one that is substituted for another, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. But when we, we don't want to take away the, the impact that anger can have on us because it can alert us to dangers and prepare us to deal with those dangers. Mm -hmm. Now, for men, we don't like to deal with emotions like sadness because they don't feel good or anxiety because it's nerve wracking. So what we do is we substitute anger, which is a very empowering emotion. The problem with that is we as men don't deal directly with our sadness or the emotions that we need to acknowledge and learn to master. Now for women, women in general, and I think it's still the case, a few years back I went onto LinkedIn mm -hmm. and I went onto a LinkedIn forum for women, identified myself as a man, and I said, I have a question. I'm the emotions doctor. And what I really want to know is what happens when you as a woman express anger? 2000 responses later, wow. the gist of it was, I as a woman cannot express anger because when I do, I get labeled, I get marginalized, I get demeaned, I get put down. And so women, even today, I think, still can't express emotions, anger directly because the men they work with don't know how to handle it. So what women do is they tend to substitute anger for sadness mm -hmm. or other, other feelings because those are okay. And these are called display rules, by the way. There are societally based display rules for what emotions can be expressed by men and for women. So my response to them was keep your anger and let it motivate you to take action, but don't express it directly. Use the anger and use it indirectly to motivate you to correct the situation. Maybe you need to take a project management approach which says, okay, what's the danger? What's the threat? And what do I need to deal with and minimize that threat? Mm -hmm. But not expressing the anger directly. Now, if you're in a position as a woman where you can, great, then express the anger, but learn how to express it in a way where it won't come back and hurt you. That's interesting, so that, you know. Yes, yeah, so that's anger and it's anxiety, mm -hmm. guilt, and, and shame. If you understand that all emotions are tools, then you can get you can educate yourself to know what the nature of the tool is, the message that it's giving you, and prepare yourself to deal with it. And he, and here's another suggestion. Uh -huh. Whatever the emotion is, what you want to learn to do is two things. First of all, you want to take a deep breath. That gives you psychological space because it lowers your arousal level. Mm. And then you want to take a physical step back from the situation, which gives you physical space. So if you take a deep breath and you take a step back, now you're and you may have to take two breaths instead of one because one might not do it. Okay. Then now you're in a position where you can look at the situation in which you find yourself and assess how appropriate the emotion is to the situation and choose a response. The problem that most people have with emotions is they react to the emotion. Mm. They assume that the information they're being given is correct and it often isn't. Yes. And then the action they take doesn't fit the situation. And then they feel, my God, what did I do now? I look like an idiot. But it's brilliant. That's... I absolutely love that because it's so true, though. How many of us do that? And mm -hmm. it's really interesting to understand the difference between men's anger and women's anger. The anger is the same, Anita. Mm -hmm. The problem is that society does not allow women to express the anger the same way that men do. Okay. If I'm in a boardroom and I get angry, I'm considered powerful and assertive mm -hmm. and taking, taking control and, and being action oriented. If a woman does it, it's like, oh, you're hormonal. <laughs> Oh, gosh, let's not go there. 
No, no, we don't want to go there, but that's what happens. Exactly. Gosh. Or, or you're emotional, and I can't deal with you because you're emotional. Fascinating. Put your emotional face away and come back when you can deal with the situation as it is, rationally. We Absolutely. say stupid things as men because we can't deal with women's anger. It's really fascinating. Mm -hmm. I'm loving it. And see, that's what I had to teach the young women I was working with. First of all, I had to teach them that they were not monsters for having done what they did. And that was a tough one because I had five young women who had killed their children. Gosh. Yeah. And, and it wasn't that they were monsters. It was situational. They were still responsible mm -hmm. and needed to, to take the, the punishment, but they weren't monsters. Once I got them past that, then I could help them understand how do you express your emotions in ways that won't get you in further trouble. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was suggesting to in my book as, as well as in terms of responses on podcasts and whatnot to women, learn how to feel your anger, validate it, and then assess it and choose how you want to respond in a way which won't get you in trouble. Absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. And what are some specific skills that the listeners can do today to begin using their emotions as a tool? The first step is to accept the idea that emotions are just tools. Mm -hmm. So what you do then is you take emotions out of the realm of these things control me. I can't do anything about mm -hmm. them. I don't understand them. So the first step is to say, okay, I don't totally understand it, but I accept Dr. Dobby's telling me that my emotions are just tools and what he's saying makes sense. So I accept emotions are just tools. Great. Where do I go from here? Now you need to educate yourself. Mm -hmm. And the best way to do that, the easiest way to do it and cheapest way to do that. Now I should preface this. Yes, I have two books on Amazon and I'd be very happy if you bought my books and you can learn from my books and that's great. But while you're waiting for the books to arrive, go to my blog. Uh -huh. And the blog is the emotionsdoctor.com. T-H-E-E-M-O-T-I-O-N-S-D-O-C-T-O-R. You've got it on your screen. I can see it. Dot com. And go to the index tab, which is in the upper left-hand corner of the homepage. Click on the index tab. You'll get a drop-down menu, which will give you access to all of my articles mm -hmm. by category. So you can educate yourself about what anger is. You can educate yourself about all, what all these emotions are. But once you accept that emotions are tools and you educate yourself as to what the emotions are and what they're telling you, you now then can practice the third step, which is to take a deep breath when you have an emotion and take a step back from the situation. You practice that, you'll learn to do it. Now, it's not easy, but it is doable. Then the next step is to assess what's going on. Sometimes you may have to leave the situation in order to gain the kind of perspective you need. If that's the case, say, you know what? I can't deal with this right now. I'll get back to you mm -hmm. and then get back to them. So now you're, you are, once you've got some perspective, you can assess what is the nature of the threat? What is the nature of the message my emotion is telling me? What is the best thing for me to do in this situation in order to help me and the person with whom I'm dealing? Mm -hmm. And so then, and then you make a decision. Now I can, let me give your, your listeners and viewers another piece of information, and that is what I call, I call it the basic relationship rule, but it's basically a way for you to understand your own behavior and the behavior of others. Mm -hmm. And here's how it works. If you understand that you and everybody else in, in the, with whom you're dealing in every situation, and I put every in quotes because it's not always going to work. Nothing is absolute. Everybody in every situation does the best they can given two things, their model of the world and their skill sets. Yes. So if you understand that now, it gives you a way to look at your own behavior, what you're doing and what the other person's doing. The emotion tells you how you perceive a situation. The basic relationship rules gives you information on how you can understand it and take action regarding it. Because your model of the world is based on the information you have about the situation in which you find yourself. Your model of the world includes what you expect to be happening. We talked about expectations earlier with stress. So your information you have 
what your expectations are. That all goes into how you perceive what's going on and mm -hmm. how you perceive what's going on gives rise to the emotion that you feel about that situation in which you find yourself. Now, when we look at skill sets, skill sets is what are the resources that you have available to you in that situation? Do you have other people you can consult? What can you do? Can you, you have to deal with it directly. Can you maybe postpone it and come back to it later? Mm -hmm. What are your communication skills? How well do you get your point across? What are the communication skills of the other person? How well do they communicate? Perhaps they're, they're the type of person that, that maybe views you as a threat because you're just more verbal than they are, whatever it happens to be. But those mm -hmm. are part of their skill sets and yours. So if you look at it that way, you now can say, okay, am I perceiving the situation correctly? Is my, does my model fit what's going on? Do I have the skill sets to deal with what's happening in the situation? And then you can decide you either are accurately seeing what's going on and you're appro approaching it appropriately, or you maybe need to change how you appro approach it and how you view it. <laughs> so that's how it all fits together. A lot of information. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it's all valid. <laughs> and once you understand that, you can actually learn how to do that for yourself. And it's so important. Yep. What a better world we'd have. That's it. And I, I mean, I, I like the idea of, of this being a master class, and I realize I'm tossing a whole bunch of information at your your viewers, but it's it's all all of it can be mastered by you, the viewer. You just may have to go over it and take it step by step. Definitely. You don't learn to drive. You don't learn to ride a, ride a bicycle or drive a car simply by getting on the bicycle or getting in the car. It's a matter of taking the time. There's a learning curve. And there's a learning curve to mastering your emotions as tools. The important thing to keep in mind is, yes, it may be difficult, mm -hmm. but it is doable. Mm -hmm. And that's the important thing. What happens most of the time is people say, this is too hard for me. This is difficult. And yeah, that's the first step. But they need to take the next step, which is to say, yes, but it's doable. Uh -huh. And then the question is, is it worth it? And in most cases, it is. Yes. That, that that's the most important one mm -hmm. your latest book is entitled beyond anger management mastering your anger as a strategic tool what do you mean when you refer to anger as a i know we've talked a bit about that okay but what yeah. i'd like to know is what do you mean by beyond anger management exactly most anger management groups and approaches don't work. Now, there are some very good ones out there that do. Mm -hmm. um, if you're in, if you're, your folks are in the U.S., then they might look up the work by Anderson and Anderson. Okay. But having said that, most anger management groups will teach you to control your anger. You, what they'll say is you need to control it. You need to put it down. You need to suppress it mm -hmm. and not deal mm -hmm. with it. And anger management don't, groups don't work because it's not control that you need to learn. They don't explain what anger is. I have a cousin <laughs> who has been in and out of jail. Mm -hmm. ex ex cousin, it's my wife's cousin, has been in and out of jail and had a problem with anger. And he went through anger management groups and when he was in the group, yeah, it kind of worked, but then he would get, get out of the group and he'd go right back to it. Uh -huh. I sent him a copy of my book and it's the first time he understood what anger was, wow. how to use it, how to use it as a tool and how to make it work for him. And once he got that information, now he was able to get past his anger. Does he still have issues with anger sometimes? Yeah. Do I still have issues with anger? Sometimes, yeah. I need to work on myself and practice what I preach. Mm -hmm. I'm getting there. Not there yet, but I'm getting there. So I'm not saying it's easy. But your anger management groups do not explain to you what anger is, why you have it, the purpose that it serves, and how to make it work for you. Anger is perceived as a dangerous emotion mm. that needs to be suppressed or controlled. So that's why in my book I said beyond anger management. Mm -hmm. Now, I do need to say something in terms of the anger cycle. And by the way, you can download a copy of that. There's a PDF on my 
my blog as well. Okay. What happens with anger is as soon as you experience the physical response, a reaction in your body that tells you you're anger, then yes, you need to, you need to exercise control. Mm -hmm. And here's why. Control in that context simply says, I will not act out on my anger at that moment. Because if you don't control it and you act out, now you're in deep yogurt again. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you control it at that point. But you need to go beyond that. And when you go beyond that, you need to say, okay, what's the nature of the threat? How appropriate is my anger in this situation? And what do I need to do about it? Because again, with anger, sometimes it's a secondary emotion. We talked about that earlier. In men, I may be getting angry because what I'm feeling is anxiety, or mm -hmm. I'm feeling sadness, or I'm feeling inadequate, or I'm feeling that as part of being inadequate, I don't measure up, or mm -hmm. that you somehow have, have more authority, control, um, expertise, whatever, than I do. So what do I need to do is I need to... Let me illustrate. If I see you as here and uh -huh. me as here, on whatever, whatever, however I'm assessing that, I have two choices. I can either elevate myself so that I'm dealing with you as an equal, or I can bring you down here. And if I use my anger, remember, you're here as I perceive you to be, and I'm here, and I'm feeling inadequate. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my anger to bring you down here. Now I can feel superior. Uh -huh. As opposed to what I really ought to be doing, which is psychologically appropriate, which is elevating myself so that we can be, deal with each other on the same level. Excellent. That's really so great. That's how you, you, yes, you control your anger outburst, your reaction, your behavior, so you don't do something you later regret. But now you need to use your anger to motivate you to take appropriate action. And that, Anita, was I, what I was suggesting to these women. Control the, out, the ex, outward expression of your anger, but keep the anger because it's appropriate. Either because you, your, your work has been stolen, you've been uh, marginalized in the work mm -hmm. setting, whatever it happens to be. The anger is appropriate. Just don't express it as anger because the people you're working with don't know how to handle it. And that's interesting. And that was my next question but i think you've just answered it um you know if somebody was struggling with something and getting angry that they might later regret how what would you be your best advice for them to deal with that but yeah exactly perfect now example. somebody directs their anger at you mm -hmm. now it's just the, the flip side of that how do you deal with that mm -hmm. well the first thing you need to do is not react because see what we want to do, okay, so here we are, we're here and somebody gets angry at us. What do we do? We get angry at them. Yes. What do they do? They escalate and get angry at them. Now there's a technique here that most people don't know. When somebody is yelling at you, what do you do? What you want to do is yell back. Yeah. Yes. What you need to do is whisper. Mm -hmm. And here's why. We're escalating. Mm -hmm. They're up here, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if you whisper, they're going to have to stop yelling because they want to hear what you have to say so that they can counter it. So when they do that, they need to come here. And when they come here, now you can talk to them. Yes. So when someone's yelling at you, you whisper back to them. Now, when they do that, now here's how you deal with that. Remember the basic relationship rule. The person is doing the best they can, given their model of the world, how they see what's going on, and their skill sets. Now, in most cases, it's probably going to be how they perceive what's going on, which is their model. So now you can say to them, gee, John, it seems like you're really angry with me. What do you see that's going on here that's leading to that anger? And so now they can say, well, I'm angry because you did da 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 whatever it happens to be. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Now you can respond to that, but you've de-escalated it so Excellent. that now you can have a conversation. Mm -hmm. But the trick here is to avoid reacting to them, and now you get into this escalation, mm -hmm. which happens all the time, but is yeah. never effective. Yeah, and it's so true, isn't it? But I have mm -hmm. never heard of that, if someone's angry and shouting, to whisper. So I shall take that on board. Yeah. I like that. And again, and the, it, reason, is, and the mm -hmm. reason is because mm -hmm. they want to hear what you have to say yes. so that they can come back at you. Well, they can't <laughs> hear you unless they stop yelling. Excellent. Excellent. Love it. 
How can one use your approach in dealing with someone who gets mad at them then? Again, the, 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 the first, the, the, the only person over whom I have any influence, really direct influence is me. Okay. So, so I need to make sure that I don't two things. First of all, that I don't take their anger on and make it my own. Uh huh. Okay. And secondly, so that I don't let my own reaction to them make the situation worse. Yes. So if I'm aware of those two things, now, if I do that, now I can take a step back from the situation and I can take a deep breath. Mm -hmm. That does two things. First of all, if I take a step back from them, if they see me as a physical threat, that puts distance between me and them, which gives them a little bit of safety. If I take a deep breath, then that then reduces my level of arousal may or may not impact them, but it doesn't matter because the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to validate their feelings. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing that because remember, all of us are correct for what we're feeling in the situation. It doesn't mean the situation and how we view it's correct, uh -huh. but because it's our emotion, we start out being correct with the emotion. Yes. So then I can validate their emotions. I can say, gee, John, you seem really angry with, with me. What is going on? How do you see what's happening? What have I done mm -hmm. that may have led you to be angry with me? So when I do that, when I validate them, I'm lowering the, the, the threat that they perceive because now I'm informing them that I, un I understand that they're going, that they're angry with me. I'm acknowledging they're angry rather than trying to deny it, fight it, or resist it. So now that I've, I've validated them, th my guess is in most cases, their level of arousal is going to drop as well because I'm acknowledging them. Mm -hmm. Once I do that, now we can have a discussion. Now, if they don't, if they stay angry, then you may have to say, you know what? We're going to have to take a break here. Yes. I'm, I'm going to have to leave the situation for a while, and then we can talk about it later. And that's always an option. Yes, good point. But mm -hmm. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily use that as a first option. That's your fallback. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I would attempt to, to lower the arousal level. Mm -hmm. Now, if I'm facing somebody in the street who comes up to me and is pissed off, I'm not going to try and have a discussion with them. I'm going to leave. Definitely. But if it's a, if, but if it's a coworker, if mm -hmm. it's a spouse, mm -hmm. if it's a boss, if it's somebody that's important, or if it's a kid. Mm-hmm. What we don't want to say to them is, oh, stop being angry. You've got no right to be angry here. There's nothing to be angry about. Now, yeah. that's the first thing we may want to say as a parent, but we should avoid that. Definitely. Okay, mm -hmm. the kid comes in and because we as parents don't like our kids' anger. I understand that. Mm -hmm. But they're just as entitled to, our, to their anger as we are as adults. So we For want sure. to acknowledge the angry, anger. Mm -hmm. I can see that you're angry. What are you angry about? Now, let me say something else that your your viewers may find interesting. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the word why. <laughs> yes. And here and here's the the reason for that. What most of us want to say in response to another person's behavior is why are you doing that? Mhm. Mm okay? The problem with why is this. If your boss says to you or somebody important says to you, "Why are you doing that?" your first inclination is to give a justification or an excuse. And if you're the questioner, you don't want a justification or you don't want an excuse. Mm -hmm. What you really want to know is what's the basis for the behavior. So skip the why and go to what you really want to know, which is what. What's behind the action that you're doing? What is the reason that you're doing what you're doing? So instead of asking why, ask what. Now, does that mean you have to avoid the, the word why? No, you don't. It's, you're going to use it, just it's going to happen. Just be yes. aware that in most cases, you want to substitute what for why. Excellent. Because what is what you really want to know. You want mm -hmm. to know the, what, what's underlying and leading up to the behavior that you're observing. So just ask it, what's going on? What is it that you're angry about? That's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> you have really given us so many tools, tips, steps, on mastering our emotions and so mm -hmm. many takeaways 
And just to make sure the listeners can find you online, what is your website again so they can get that information? It's the emotionsdoctor.com, T H E E M O T I O N S D O C T O R.com. And remember, when you go there, uh, you want to go up to the index tab at the top of the, uh, the home page and click on the index tab. If you want to go straight to the blog, you can. There's a, another tab that, that says blog, and that'll take you to the, the most recent article. So that's also an option. But I'd suggest if your listeners are looking for information, mm -hmm. go to the index tab first. That's the easiest. Thank you. Thank you mm -hmm. so much for sharing your deep, insightful wisdom and knowledge with us today, Ed Darby. Well, thank you for having me. It's been fun. I really enjoy doing this. And the reason I do, since I've retired, I don't do private practice, I don't work, but I really enjoy the my mission in retirement, other than to be retired and be home, is to educate people. And so this is an opportunity for me to do that. And thank you for having me and giving me that opportunity. Oh, it's fantastic. The information I should be personally using myself, I can assure you, it's so <laughs> fascinating. And it all makes sense, but we have to understand why are we behaving the way we are? Mm -hmm. It's like you said, understanding ourselves. Yep. We have to understand what we're doing, which leading mm -hmm. to the behavior that we're, act, we're taking. <laughs> I've got a couple of final questions for you. Yes. What is one of the most courageous things you've done? One of the most courageous things I've ever done. I, when I was, was working, we had a, a, a young man who, the institution wanted to keep locked up beyond his time. Uh -huh. The way it works in California is as a, as a juvenile, you go to court, they say you're, you're sentenced for 18 months, two years, whatever it happens to be. Mm -hmm. If in California it's believed that you need to do more time, then an 1800 petition can be filed. So the team was saying they wanted to 1800 this kid. I did my psychological testing and I did not believe the kid needed to be locked up. Okay. Okay. So I get called into the superintendent of the institution and you need to understand the setting. Here's this guy. He's a big guy and he's got behind his desk, this huge picture of him in his military uniform. And I mean, he almost looked like a, a dictator from a Central American country. Gosh. Right. And it was designed to be intimidating. Mm. So I'm sitting across from him and he's looking at me and he says, Dr. Dobby, are you a team player? I said, yes, sir, I am. He said, well, do you know what the team is recommending? Yes, sir, I do. They're recommending an 1800. You are not saying that. You need to be a team player. I said, sir, I said, I am a team player, but you need to understand that ethically I have a responsibility to my profession and my data, and I'm going to go with that. Wow. At which point he looked at me and he snuffled on. He said, well, you need to be a team player, Dr. Dobby. You're dismissed. Oh, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't know what he was going to do. But at that point, it didn't matter because I had an ethical responsibility mm. to my professional information. And that ethical responsibility overrode whatever it was the team felt that I should be doing. That's probably the most courageous thing I've ever done. Absolutely. You've got to go with your own ethics. You've got to stand up to people. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. Right. But the whole situation was designed to intimidate people. Mm -hmm. And it was very intimidating. And I, anyway, I, I did what I had to do and it worked out fine, but it took a lot of courage. Can you imagine? Yep. Yeah. And, and courage, by the way, is, I mean, you hear first responders saying all the time, no, I, I, I was af afraid, but I know what I had to do. Mm. That's what is the basis of feel the fear and do mm. it anyway. Their fear mm -hmm. in that situation is real. It's a dangerous situation, but they're doing what they need to do. Sometimes mm. fear is just fear and it isn't an anxiety and you got to move past it. Definitely. So what is your definition of courage? Courage is realizing what needs to be done how important it is that it needs to be done and deciding to take that action, even though there is risk, it's assessing the risk, understanding the risk and taking the action that needs to be done in spite of the risk. It's not ignoring the risk. Mm. It's acknowledging it, 
but doing what needs to be done because it's the right thing to do and because it needs to be done in that situation. In that case, the benefit outweighs the risk. The risk is still there, but the benefits of taking action outweigh that risk and you need to take the action. And that's what first responders need to do. It's also, by the way, why they don't see themselves as heroes. Uh -huh. Because first responders say, no, I was not a hero. I was just doing what I need to do. Well, yes, they are a hero. But yes, also, they're doing what needs to do because they're assessing the risk and taking the action because the benefit outweighs the risk, even if it's a personal risk, in which case, in most cases, is what it is. But by the same token, Anita, if I need to confront, confront in quotes, a coworker, that also takes courage. Yes. Because I don't know what the result's going to be. So I just need to choose how I want to take that action. So courage isn't just running into a burning building. Courage may be saying to your coworker, I disagree with that. Or it may be saying to a kid, no, you cannot take the car tonight because yada, yada, yada. <laughs> so courage is assessing the risk and taking the action anyway because it's the right thing to do. So I want to emphasize again, learning to master your emotions as tools is difficult, but it is doable. And I also want to mention that if you're experiencing really severe emotions like depression or suicidal feelings, understand that the help is out there. Now, that may not be any of your viewers, but sometimes it is. Yes. And I want to put that in there because those emotions can also be mastered. And you're not alone. Help is out there. Help is in the form of my blog to get information. Help is in, in the form of hotlines that are available. You can learn to master your emotions. It's worth the effort. So make it happen because you can do it. Mm -hmm.